This is EHJ Today at the annual scientific sessions of the American Heart Association in Chicago 2014. I'm Tom Lucher, Editor-in-Chief of the European Heart Journal, and I have the pleasure to discuss the Improve It trial with its primary investigator, Chris Cannon from uh, Boston and Neil Stone from Chicago. Welcome, gentlemen. Well, thank you. So, Chris, uh, tell us a little bit, what made you design this trial? What was the hypothesis and the clinical question behind it? Well, we've known that lowering cholesterol with statins has been one of the major advances in cardiology. Sure. And the big question has been whether a non-statin drug could add to statin therapy. And so we want to look at azetamibe as to whether adding that on top of statin would be beneficial. And then while doing that, we made the control arm reaching current guideline levels to see whether going even lower on cholesterol levels would be of added benefit. So what was the uh, limit you wanted to achieve before patients were entering the trial? Well, we studied acute coronary syndrome patients, so in the f day, 10 days following. So High-risk patients, basically. So high-risk patients. Uh, and had the LDLs no higher than 125 in milligrams per deciliter, which I should know what it is in millimoles, um, but basically to try and make sure that in the statin-only arm, where we started with simvastatin 40, up titrated to 80 in about a quarter patients to reach the 70 goal or the 1.8. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other group also got azetamibe, uh, where we thought it'd be about 1.4 was the guesstimate. Right. And uh, how many patients did you enroll, and how, how did you design the trial? It was a randomized trial, I assume. And uh, So a randomized trial, 40 countries around the world, 18,144 patients. Mm -hmm. um, the, the duration of the trial was longer than we anticipated, a mean of six years of treatment in part because the patients were doing well with the aggressive treatment in both arms. What was the event rate per year, roughly? Well, it's curvilinear, so higher in the, in the early years. Out through uh, seven-year event rates, we found in the statin-only arm, it was 34.7%, and that's for a five-part composite of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, unstable angina, or revascularization. So it's a rather high, actually, huh? A high, definitely, it's, a, it's a, you know, the highest risk coronary group of right. this post-ACS. Right. Um, and so what did you find? Well, we found a, a significant reduction in events when adding the non-statin agent. It, uh, the event rate went from 34.7 to 32.7, so that's a 6.4% uh, risk reduction. Relative risk reduction. Relative risk reduction. Absolute is about 2%. So absolute about 2%, so an NNT of 50 over treating over the duration of the trial. Mm -hmm. And the curves separated after about a year, so mm -hmm. nice findings, mm -hmm. relatively similar to what many of the statin trials are. Not quite like the Prove It trial that had earlier separation, yeah. but it wasn't too long a, a lag. But were, were also the, the changes in LDL cholesterol less pronounced than in Prove It? We did. There was a, we had anticipated about a 15 milligram per deciliter, mm -hmm. like 0.35 or so millimoles, mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually what we saw. It was 69 versus 54, um, which is roughly 1.8 and 1.4, I think, uh, or something like that. Um, and so um, about half the difference that we had in Prove It, um, and that over. A, the six-year period, you know, did translate into into benefit, and we came away with really the the concept that we could see benefit with a non-statin agent as being very reassuring. That's very exciting, yes. Uh, and the 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 amount of uh, effect you have and the total uh, endpoint was was consistent with the hypothesis uh, that you generated from the degree of lowering of LDL you achieved? So exactly that, that um, looking, we had planned about a 9% treatment effect and that's if we had perfect compliance for a shorter duration of the trial. Um, but when we plotted it on the CTT line, it falls 
just about on the line and depending on how we analyze it. And that was one endpoint and Mike Blazing has looked at all the different endpoints that they've reported and many line up. Interestingly, MI and stroke were the things that were significantly reduced. Just a trend on revascularization, so seemingly or maybe a little bit less effect on preventing need for revascularization. But we've only had the data for two weeks, so we're still trying to sort through. Yes. What about uh, mortality and cardiovascular mortality? So we hadn't anticipated and didn't see any difference in mortality. Um, that also hasn't been seen with high dose versus regular dose statins. I think, but I don't know that because it's a more modest difference in cholesterol than was seen say in 4S that had a, a huge difference. Yeah. And the final thing I think to say is that for safety, um, we found no differences in any of the endpoints over this, the, the entire duration of the trial. So a very nice safety profile. Uh, at very well tolerated drug. Yeah. Yeah. So Neil Stone was the discussant. Uh, so what did you, what do you uh, think about uh, this uh, trial? Well, first I want to congratulate Chris and his, uh, and his colleagues for giving us a truly uh, superb piece of work, but most importantly, a piece of work that we've needed. It reaffirms, I think, the biology that uh, LDL cholesterol is, plays a causal role in atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. And although our guidelines didn't look at, at hard targets, because that's another discussion perhaps, there's no question that they play a causal role. And that's why our guidelines were called the uh, treatment guidelines to reduce blood cholesterol, not just high blood cholesterol to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and stroke. So now clinicians can feel good about point number two, that they've got an option added to a statin that is not just effective. We've had some effective options by partial ileal bypass, but that's not, not practical. No, no. And now we have a safe and effective option. The fact it went seven, six to seven years is a, some people thought, boy, it took a long time to get out. But how great is that that we've got all this safety data? So now we know that not lower is better because remember niacin uh, didn't add increment to statins, estrogen, progestin lowered LDL but didn't improve risk in women with CAD. But now we've got lower is better with proven therapy consistent with our guidelines. And just my third point is uh, uh, that it opens the door for some other therapies and the hope is they can be just as safe because they could possibly get LDL lower. But I would say that I commend them for giving us a safe therapy that gave us not a huge incremental benefit because the big work was done by the statin, sure. no question. But some incremental benefit to it is going to be very welcome for this high-risk group. So you think that this is also a good sign for the PCSK9 inhibitors that even if you have reasonable LDL levels that you can get lower and have a, an additional benefit? What I would say is it opens the door for them to show us. Right. You know, I like to say I'm from Missouri. Show me yes. that you can get show LDL, <laughs> that you can get LDL lower, yeah. and you can do it safely. Yeah. That's what th th I think the the balance message is so important here because um, uh, this trial looks different than some of the recent trials that failed to show incremental benefit yes. to statins. And, and by the way, I'd point out our guidelines anticipated this because we wrote in the high-risk groups of our guidelines, secondary prevention, diabetes, LDL on a primary basis more than 190, you could add a non-statin, but preferentially if it was shown in a randomized clinical trial to be both effective and safe. Well, Chris, uh, Dr. Chris Cannon and his colleagues have done that for us. Right. Uh, it's just the last uh, issue is the guidelines. You know that the Europeans are more target-oriented while the uh, Americans are more risk-oriented. Right. And now uh, we talked a lot about uh, the cholesterol levels and uh, how does this fit into the American approach? I think it fits perfectly fine. Uh, remember, we say not just lower is better. You don't have to reach some goal above which risk is present and below which risk magically disappears. I think those rigid targets performance measures, but the idea of Chris has shown us, the, and his study has shown us the value of getting LDL even lower than we thought could provide value to the highest risk people. 
But the caveat is this drug was not tested in primary prevention right. populations. These are the highest risk people where this incremental benefit may make sense. Because you have a, a, a quite a good uh, event rate to, to work on. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing this important data with us.